unusual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please press star one now if you would like to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank the Tesla team for an incredible job this quarter. The execution was outstanding and um, on, on just about every front. So um, it's uh, just an honor to work with such a great uh, team. Uh, Q3 Q Q was uh, obviously a very strong quarter. We had record deliveries. Uh, we were able to uh, make great strides in controlling our costs. Uh, we shifted back to gap profitability while also generating strong free cash flow. Um, and again, this would not be possible without um, each uh, employee doing a part to reduce cost. Our operating cost is now at the lowest level since Model 3 production started. Uh, regarding Gigafactory Shanghai, this month we started trial production at um, Giga Shanghai and have built uh, four vehicles from uh, body to paint to general assembly. Uh, so this is a I want to emphasize this is a, a real factory with a tremendous amount of equipment in it. Um, while a lot of people see the the outside shell of the factory, which is enormous um, and was essentially uh, underwater uh, in January, it was uh, below the water table literally. Um, what what is I think much more significant is that we're able to install uh, massive stamping machines, uh, a fully operational paint shop, and and a sophisticated general assembly line uh, in the same period of time in parallel with building the building. Um, I'd like to thank our Chinese team for this extraordinary achievement. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any, any factory of, of this magnitude in history being uh, constructed in such a short period of time, uh, approximately 10 months. Um, as, as far as I know, this is unprecedented. Um, and, and Gig Factory Shanghai will become our template for future growth. Um, we're planning to build Model Ys in Shanghai as well, of course, um, and to build a Gigafactory in Europe. And we hope to announce uh, the location of that Gigafactory. In fact, we will announce the, the location of that Gigafactory before the end of this year. Uh, regarding Model Y, uh, we're also ahead of schedule on Model Y preparations in Fremont. Uh, and we've moved the launch timeline from fall 2020 to summer 2020. Um, the, there may be some room for improvement there, but we're confident about uh, summer 2020. Uh, I've actually recently driven the Model Y um, release candidate and think it's going to be an amazing product and be, be very well received. I think it's quite likely to, I, I might, this is just my opinion, but I, I think it will outsell S, X, and 3 combined. Um, regarding version 10 and Smart Summon, last month we re released our latest uh, software version 10, which includes video streaming, games, uh, karaoke, Spotify, and, and uh, a host of other new features and improvements. Uh, most importantly, it includes uh, the first version of Smart Summon, which has now been used uh, uh, a million times. Uh, so it's now over a million uses of Smart Summon. Um, and we're, in the next uh, week or so, we will be releasing an improved version of Smart Summon, taking into account all the data from those million Smart Summon attempts. So it's, um, this really illustrates the value of having uh, a, a massive fleet um, because it allows us to collect the, these corner cases um, and uh, learn from them and use fleet learning and become uh, rapidly better, just as Navigator and Autopilot did on the freeway. So we ex expect a, um, a number of improvements in Spot 7 in, in, the, in the weeks to come. And, um, and, and this is really just the beginning as we collect more data and autopilot and pull self-driving functionality get get better. Um, I, 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 I do, while it's going to be tight, I, it, it still does appear that uh, we'll be at least in limited, in, in uh, early access release of a feature complete pull self-driving feature this year. Um, so it's not, it's not for sure, but it, it appears to be on track for at least an early access release of a fully functional full self-driving by the end of this year. Um, and um, yeah, lastly, we're, we're highly focused on decisions that really make a material difference to the company, uh, such as opening um, gigafactories and uh, other continents. Uh, yes, it's 
it's worth noting that these, you know, ultimately having three gigafactories effectively will triple our, our output. And then when you consider uh, increased output per gigafactory, it's going to actually more than triple uh, our output over time. Um, and then uh, there are a lot of interesting things happening with respect to advanced batteries and more efficient powertrains. Um, and also driving and all that sort of stuff, but uh, that will be something for a future time. Um, and then one, one last item is that uh, tomorrow afternoon um, we'll be uh, releasing version three of the Tesla solar roof. That's the integrated solar with it, where solar uh, the solar panels are integrated with the roof. Um, so that's um, I, I think this is a great, a great, a great product. Version one and two, we're still sort of figuring things out. Version three, I think, is finally ready for for the, for the big time. Um, and so we're scaling scaling up production of the version three uh, solar tile roof uh, at our Buffalo Gigafactory, and we I think this product is going to be incredible. But we'll talk more about that on the official product launch, which will be tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much, and I think uh, Zach, uh, Zachary has some uh, remarks as well. Yeah, thank you, Elon. Uh, thank you, Martin. Q3 was a great quarter for Tesla. I know many employees are listening right now, and I want to thank you for your passion and your hard work. We've made terrific progress, and yet again, we realized margin improvements in nearly every aspect of the business. There are three key points I'd like to highlight. First, we returned to profitability in Q3, aided by improved gross profit, reduced operating expenses, in the absence of negative one-time items that weighed on our financials in the first half of the year. Gap Automotive gross margin improved sequentially to 22.8% and over 20% excluding regulatory credits. We re achieved these improvements through higher production volumes on SX and Model 3, enabling better fixed cost absorption. We realized improvements in labor hours per vehicle as well as other costs such as warehousing, logistics, delivery, and import-related items. We are also making continued progress reducing material costs, including commercial negotiations with suppliers. Model S and X ASPs increased, even accounting for revenue deferrals related to free unlimited supercharging. And Model 3 ASPs declined slightly, driven by mix in Asia, pricing action in EMEA. North American ASPs held flat as mix improved, offsetting pricing action we took at the start of the quarter, which is great to see. Note that with the release of Smart Summon in the U.S., we were able to recognize $30 million of deferred revenue. As we expand Smart Summon to additional markets and release new features, we'll continue to recognize additional deferred revenue. Our services and other loss reduced yet again, reflecting our focus to improve the efficiency of this area of the business. And we further reduced operating expenses despite increased orders, deliveries, and new programs in development. Uh, and finally, on net income, in other income, we saw benefits from foreign exchange, which, as I mentioned last quarter, we don't hedge. Uh, the second key point I want to highlight is that we demonstrated another quarter of strong free cash flows, despite a significant increase in our captive leasing mix and a sequential increase in CapEx spend. This has enabled year-to-date positive free cash flows for the company. Our cash balance increased by approximately the same amount as our free cash flows, and we exited the quarter with our highest quarter-ending cash balance ever of just over $5.3 billion. Specifically on captive leases, we've received a number of questions on how these are funded. We use our leasing warehouse and ABS sales to allow for captive leases without material use of cash. Uh, what's important to note here is that our warehouse and ABS flow through financing cash flow, and as a result, leases negatively impact free cash flow. This impact was material in Q3 as the lease rate increased substantially by 50%. In addition, CapEx spend increased, driven primarily by Gigafactory Shanghai and Model Y spending. We've received a number of questions on why our capital spending appears low compared to prior levels, even though there are multiple new projects launching and in development. As we noted in the shareholder letter this quarter and last quarter, this is because we've made great progress on improving our capital efficiency. Uh, my third and final point is around demand and growth. Our global order rate remains strong and continues to increase. Despite increases to production levels, our order backlog has been growing. And quarter-to-date orders are significantly higher than at this point in, uh, in last quarter. In the immediate term, we're focused on increasing production of Model 3 and SNX as quickly as we can. 
The bulk of this work involves continued optimization of existing equipment. We've also made targeted adjustments to pricing to better balance supply and demand. Our pace of execution on new factories and capacity expansion has increased significantly. As Elon mentioned, the first phase of Gigafactory Shanghai is already production ready, and we've been able to pull in the timeline for other major projects. Overall, we are quickly turning the corner for our next phase of growth, and our financial health continues to strengthen. We remain focused on reducing cost, which enables rapid investments in future programs and growth. Thank you very much. And uh, I think also our Senior Director of Energy Operations, Kunal Girotra, uh, wanted to um, have some remarks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kunal Girotra, and I've been with Tesla for about four years, uh, working on different aspects of deploying our energy products. Um, I now run Tesla Energy's deployment and fulfillment teams. Um, over the last three months, the energy teams have made great progress in both our solar and energy storage businesses. As you can see in our quarterly deck, our solar deployments uh, rose by almost 50% over the last quarter, and our energy storage deployments, which include power walls and power packs, uh, grew by 15% to an all-time high of 477 megawatt hours. Um, in the last three months, we relaunched Tesla Solar in North America by simplifying our solar offering into three sizes of small, medium, and large, with transparent pricing on the website. Uh, uh, actually, actually, if, yeah. if I may interject, sure, uh, but, uh, sure. yeah. but a lot of th what, what a lot of people don't realize is in like in, in California and in, in a number of other states, if you um, if you buy, buy our sort of solar subscription or solar rental, um, there's no money down, and you instantly save on your utility bill, and there's no long-term contract. Right. Um, so it, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's, it's really do you, do you want an, uh, an, uh, something that prints money? Um, and if it doesn't print money, we'll fix it or take it back. It's kind of a no-brainer, um, and it, 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 it sort of plays into Tesla's overarching strategy here, which is effectively to become like a giant distributed global utility Yeah, on, on the energy front. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, the subscription solar offering that you mentioned is launched in six states, and uh, like you said, it's six monthly payments and no long-term contracts, and the mm -hmm. response from customers has been pretty awesome. So well, well, most people do actually buy it as yes. opposed to rent it, which is act actually the... the, the it's technically, the better out. While well, you make money immediately if you if you rental, it's actually a better investment if you if you buy it, um, because the cost of capital of the consumer is better than uh, our cost of capital, um, and um, uh, and and then uh, there's, there's like interesting study by Zillow and, and a number of other organizations that show that uh, adding solar to your home uh, increases the price of the increase of the value of your home, and it, the, below, the Zillow study showed a four percent uh, increase in the value of the home with solar. Um, and that, that, and then if you, if you add sort of the power wall, which gives you uh, blackout protection, so you will have uh, you know energy security in the event of of uh, rolling blackouts, or if the power goes out for any reason, which appears to be a long term systemic issue in in California particularly, um, that that I think is definitely going to be viewed as a, a significant asset for any home. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think to your point of uh, buying Tesla Solar is easy because uh, we have one of the lowest prices in the nation now uh, in, in the country. And, you know, just a little bit of story there. We were able to lower our prices because our cost of acquisition is now, you know, less than a quarter of any typical solar company. We don't do, do our, sales. Yeah, do our online sales. There's, there's online no, orders. no advertising, right. no marketing, right. and no sales force. Yeah. But would, would you rather pay for, for power or for marketing? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say you would rather pay for the product. <laughs> Totally. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. On solar, we've also simplified the fulfillment process with a goal of really fast order to install timelines. Uh, we've done we've done many uh, residential installs with a single visit to a customer's home because of standard sizes that reduce complexity. Uh, we've also been working with cities and counties to submit generic permits that follow a template rather than customizing for every situation. Because uh, actually, Carl, this is a really big deal. That's like for most people won't, won't appreciate. Um, it's, it's great work by you and the, the energy team to get this done because one of the fundamental in uh, inhibitors, both from a cost and, and timing standpoint, is um, getting uh, permit approval from the various uh, regional authorities. Of, um, and uh, and, and we've, we've pioneered a, a novel approach. Um, it's sort of innovation applied to bu uh, to bureaucracy, frankly, um, which in you can apply innovation to anything. Um, and, uh, and and we've gotten um, a, a, a massive number of uh, housing approval authorities to um, 
to, to take a, a generic template as opposed to a custom template, which makes it, and, and, and in uh, um, most cases, I think electronic as well. Yeah. Um, so that, that just pr it makes it simple and low cost and fast to get approval for solar, which is how it should be. Totally. Yeah, around 350 cities and counties have accepted it. There's still and, about and, more, and more, more coming. And then many more coming. Yeah, around. I think ultimately it'll be almost everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot more small cities and counties that have to uh, come online, but that'll be that'll be our focus in the coming days. Yeah. And it's more important as we scale Solar Roof too. Um, yes, exactly. For all our deploying energy products, uh, needs innovation on that in the bureaucracy space, as you said as well. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so all these improvements have led us to speed up our customer order to installation timelines from months to, in many cases, days. Uh, as, as Elon, you already said, we've added uh, the option to add power walls to secure from people from future power outages. And a home with solar and power wall, as was shown in the recent California outages, many homes ran successfully. Yeah, you can uh, tell which homes have a, 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 yeah. uh, a power wall because um, that's where all the light. That's where the lights are on. Yeah, yeah so you like look at the neighborhood, it's like, oh, there's a little bit of few lights around, and those are usually the ones with the tons of power wall. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if you're going to mention, but also like the single truck roll, uh, like, yeah. Yeah. single visit install. Yeah. So a single visit install is, is a big deal. Right. Um, it, we're taking it from where the solar industry would often be three visits before the solar was installed, and it would often take quite, quite a long time to do the installation, or we streamlined all of that to the point where um, in many cases, it's a single. It's it's a single visit um, to do everything, um, and and uh, and it's and it's fast. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. So it's a low, minimized disruption to the homeowner. Yeah, and and ordering solar is literally one click. You can order solar for your house in less than one minute. Totally. Yeah, and then we've done the same thing in the commercial solar space. Uh, uh, nobody thought of putting a simple left side with uh, or with prices for commercial solar. We do that now and. Uh, We've seen a good response from small businesses wanting to go solar, and uh, by removing the complexity of long-term contracts and simplifying the terms and conditions, the commercial solar sales process would typically take six months is now taking a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So the same thing uh, that we've done in residential, we want to expand more and more in commercial as well. So all in all, the roadmap for energy products from solar, solar roof, power wall to mega pack is super exciting, and I expect Tesla Energy to become a larger part of our overall ecosystem as we leverage and integrate the same competencies from our vehicle business. Um, the future is pretty exciting for just Tesla Energy. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, first, we're going to take some questions from say.com. Um, we will this time take questions from both institutional investors as well as retail investors. So the first question from institutional investors is, what are the opportunities for, for Tesla to create demand? Is word of mouth still sufficient, or should we expect to see Tesla commerce advertising in the near future? Yeah, what we're seeing is that uh, word of mouth is um, just, um, more than enough to drive uh, our demand in excess of production. We have no plans to uh, advertise at this time. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, at some point in the future, we, we may do advertising, not in the traditional sense, but more to just inform people and make sure that they are aware of the product but not um, engage in the typical trickery that is, is commonplace in uh, advertising. Okay. Uh, the next question from institutional investor is, uh, Elon, other than robo-taxis and autonomous vehicle capabilities, when you look over the next three years, what are you most excited about at Tesla that you believe investors don't understand or have missed? I think there's generally a um, lack of, of understanding or appreciation for the growth of Tesla Energy, as Kanal was talking about. Um, in the long term, I expect Tesla Energy to be of the same, uh, r r roughly the same size as Tesla's automotive uh, sector or business. Um, this is uh, this is the most underappreciated. I think it could be bigger, but it's, it's certainly of, of a similar magnitude uh, Tesla Solar, meaning so Tesla Solar plus battery stuff uh, is, uh, to Tesla Energy is, is, is I think, the, the least uh, appreciated element. Um, and, um, you know, for the, um, here, you know, part of it is like for, 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 I don't know, for about 18 months, almost two, almost two years, 
we had to divert a tremendous amount of resources. Or we had to basically take resources from every else, everywhere else in the company and apply them to the Model 3 production, fixing, fixing the Model 3 production ramp and simplifying the design of Model 3. Um, so for about a year and a half, we unfortunately stripped uh, Tesla Energy of, of uh, engineering and other resources. Uh, and, and even it, it took the, the cell production lines that were meant for Powerwall and Powerpack and, and redirect them to the car because we can um, we don't have enough uh, cells. Um, now that we feel uh, that uh, Model 3 production is in, in, in a good place and headed to a great place, uh, we've um, uh, re restored resources to Tesla solar and uh, storage, and, uh, and, and so we, that's going to be, uh, I think, a really crazy growth for as far into the future as I can imagine. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, we, we, had, we had to do it because the, if we didn't solve Model 3, Tesla wouldn't survive. So, um, uh, unfortunately, that, that shorted pretty much the other part, parts of the company. Um, but it, it would be difficult for me to uh, overstate the degree to which I think Tesla Energy is going to be a, a major part of Tesla's uh, activity in the future. Um, and and I, I mean, Tesla's mission from the beginning has been to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy that means sustainable energy generation and sustainable uh, energy consumption in the form of uh, vehicles, electric, electric vehicles. Um, and I think one of the stats we'll publish in the future, along with our uh, uh, vehicle production, is that how much uh, sustainable energy Tesla produced or, or Tesla customers produced with our products. Um, and I think you'll see that we're producing uh, – about the same, well, comparable amounts of, of sustainable energy as as are consumed in the car, in, in, in our cars. Because you know, the, the, for, for the longest time, the rebuttal against electric cars like, oh, are, don't they use dirty power from coal? Well, well, no, we we're, we're, we're solar power, and that's the, obviously the solar power can, companies not that not just Tesla, but um, you have to so, solve sustainable generation and sustainable consumption, um, and um, and that's what we're doing, and we'll do more of it. Okay, thank you. The next question um, from investor is uh, related to full self-driving attach rates. Given that self-driving regulations will evolve unevenly in different markets, would you consider selling modules individually, for example, navigate an autopilot or summon, versus current strategy of selling the package as a whole in order to encourage adoption and getting more data? I, th I think we'll continue to sell it in a bundled fashion. I mean, any Tesla that you buy already has um, basic autopilot included. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that, that that really is a pretty major advantage relative to other cars. Uh, but, I, but then and then the next step will be full self-driving uh, with uh, with Smart Summon being kind of the beginning of that. Um, and, uh, you know, and... and, and Obviously, we kind of have the two sides of it: we're highway or pilot, and we've got Summon, which is sort of low speed and in parking lots and that kind of thing. Now we need to, to uh, and we're working on solving the, the intermediate portion, which is traffic lights and stop signs, um, and navigating through uh, windy uh, roads in windy narrow roads in suburban neighborhoods. Um, that, that's the folks right now. Um, you're going to want it all. It's, it's, yeah, it's something that everyone's going to want, for sure. Okay. Now, and, and, and as I said before, like, at the point at which we're able to um, upload the software enabling a Tesla to become um, a robo-taxi, uh, you know, which we you know, expect to have that from, from, from a functionality standpoint by, by the end of next year. The you know in terms of but the functionality so basic functionality aspirationally end of this year but reliable enough that you do not need to pay attention in our opinion by the end of next year um, then we would need the, the acceptance by regulatory authorities will vary by jurisdiction uh, that 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 transition that that sort of flipping the switch from a car that it is. Uh, from from not robo taxi to robo taxi, I think will probably be the the biggest step change increase in asset value in history, by far. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, with respect to Model Y, uh, what is your latest expectations for, uh, for launch timing? Do you anticipate any Model 3 production downtime at Fremont during the launch? And how should Model Y gross margin percent look compared to Model 3 gross margin? Well, we've talked about the, the launch timing. What, what really matters is the timing to um, with volume production, where volume production is some number in excess of 1,000 units per week, um, and we're confident of reaching that point um, no later than uh, the middle of 2020. Um, the, uh, yeah, so from an interference standpoint, we do not expect it to interfere. Uh, the, yeah, the, the body line is separate. The paint, paint line is, so it, it, basically we do not expect, expect it to interfere with uh, Model 3. We do not, do not expect any downtime. Uh, from a margin standpoint, I agree with it. Yeah, from a margin perspective, uh, we're expecting ASPs for Model Y to be slightly higher than they are for Model 3. And this is common in the industry between sedans and CUVs. Uh, the part that we've worked very hard on is controlling the cost of Model Y. And our steady state forecast for that program puts the cost at roughly equivalent to Model 3. So though there will be ramp inefficiencies at first, of course, as we launch the program. But as it stabilizes with steady state production, we do expect that it'll be a higher margin pro product. It's something that we're very excited about within the company.
Okay, uh, thank you. And the last question from institutional investors is, uh, can you provide an update on FSB, FSD package attach rates? As FSD attach rates improve, will you let the financial benefits manifest in high growth margins for company and shareholders, or will you lower the price uh, to drive delivery volume? Um, I don't think we're going to need to lower the price of FSD. Um, but I expect the price of it. to increase slowly um, as the, cap the functionality and capability improve. Um, that's, uh, that, that is unchanged. Um, anything you want to add? Um, I, I mean, our, our cash gross margin is obviously is, is higher than our gap gross margin because of unrecognized revenue associated with FSD attach rate, so um, that, that's why there's, I think it's in the order of 600 million, or, 12, or in the order of half a billion, 500, up to half a billion of uh, unrecognized revenue. Uh, so, so if you if you were to in, include that, um, which would obviously be recognized as we um, release the uh, full driving functionality, the actual gross margin that we're operating on on a cash basis today is higher than the gap gross margin. Okay, uh, let's now go to questions from retail investors. Uh, the first question from Craig is, can you provide more detail on the deep scale acquisition, its importance, and whether Tesla is still on track to recognize and respond to traffic lights and stop signs with automatic driving on city streets by the end of 2019? Sure, deep scale is a very tiny company. Um, you know, it's basically um, about 12 people um, and it's, uh, they have some expertise in increasing the, uh, um, the, the efficiency of neural nets for a given amount of, of compute, uh, which I think is, is helpful. Um, so, you know, it, it remains to be seen, but the, the intent behind it, what was a, a very tiny acquisition, um, was to, uh, I think, slightly accelerate FSD, um, uh, that that's the intent, and hopefully that will t turn out to be true. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question um, we've already answered regarding Model Y delivery, so we'll jump to the third question from Craig. Uh, news reports suggest that uh, Gigafactory Three already uh, may already be producing Model Threes for Chinese market. Could you please update us on the production expectations for Giga Three, and confirm purpose of the second building now being built? Is that for battery production? As suggested by some press outlets. Yeah, we're we're in trial production of Model Three, um, or um, basically sending cars through the Twilio system, and um, the we're, we're ramping rapidly. Um, we're, we're expecting to hit volume production in in a few months, essentially. Um, the, the second building is indeed for uh, battery and module production, um, and uh, that's probably going to be able to just possibly a bunch more construction beyond what, what's already there, because obviously we need to uh, build out facilities for Model Y production at uh, in Shanghai as well. Okay. Um, the next question from retail investors is, can you update us on the initial results of Tesla car insurance, is there a timeline to expand it nationally and internationally? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, so far, we've lost, uh, launched Tesla insurance in California. Uh, I have to say that I'm quite pleased by the results so far. 
the take rates uh, as measured by quote to purchase conversion are quite high by industry standards and we expect that this will only increase um, as folks uh, understand the products better and uh, uh, receive some of the known price increases coming from some of the standard carriers that they'll come to us and, and look for an alternative. Um, there's a bunch of work happening behind the scenes on improving the product, particularly the purchase flow, to, to make sure it's the best product experience for our customers. And we're also working very hard to get other states lined up in the states and then also um, to launch in some countries internationally. So we're not, we're not able to provide specific timelines on those changes, but we're definitely working as quickly as we can, um, given how well-received Tesla insurance has been in California. Yeah, I think it's, it also has a secondary effect of ensuring that uh, the third-party providers of insurance uh, are, provide reasonable rates to our customers. I completely agree. The goal here is not to have um, an outsized market share of insurance. It's just to make sure that uh, that customers have an alternative to other companies as well uh, if those rates are high. I mean, ultimately, what makes the most sense for a total cost of ownership perspective is for folks to have a good pricing on their insurance. Yes, exactly. Okay, and the last question from retail investors. Um, there is skepticism regarding uh, your comment that the full self-driving will be feature complete by year-end, like resulting uh, from confusion about feature complete, what feature complete means. Uh, could you please talk to this and perhaps give us a list of features that establish the FSD baseline? Yeah, by feature, compl feature complete, I mean it's able the car is able to drive from um, in, uh, from one's house to to work, um, most likely without interventions. Um, so it will still be supervised, but it will it it will be able to uh, drive. Uh, um, it will fill in the gap from the low speed autonomy. Uh, you've got low speed autonomy with Simon. We've got high speed autonomy on the highway, and we need intermediate speed autonomy, which really just means track flights and uh, stop signs. Um, so, um, uh, feature complete means it's, able, it's, it's uh, most likely able to do that without intervention, without 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 uh, human intervention. But it would, it would still be supervised. Um, and, the, and I've gone through this timeline before, I think several times, but it is often um, misconstrued uh, that there's, there's like there's, there's the three major levels to autonomy. There's um, the car being able to be autonomous but requiring supervision at, and intervention at times. That's feature complete. Then there's, um, uh, and, and it doesn't mean like every scenario everywhere on earth, including every corner case. It means most of the time. Um, and uh, then there's another level, which is that we think it's that, that from a Tesla standpoint, we think the car is safe enough to be driven without supervision. Then the third level would be that regulators are also convinced that the car can be driven um, autonomously without supervision. Those are three different levels. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Shireen, we can now go to the uh, questions from analysts. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star then 1, and we request that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Our first question comes from Dan Galvez with Wolf Research. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I was hoping that you could give us uh, a little bit more color on um, sizing up the key factors in the, the auto gross margin improvement from Q3 to Q2. Um, Particularly, you mentioned some non-recurring items in the uh, in the letter, and also, you know, should investors be prepared for any meaningful headwinds as the China plant um, comes up, but isn't at full production yet? Yeah, I can provide a couple of comments on that. Uh, on your final, on your last question about China headwinds, there are always ramp inefficiencies when we launch a new factory. So we don't expect China to be any different than that. Uh, so there will be some uh, that we experience in Q4. The amount of that is hard to forecast, uh, given that it's a different type of factory design than we than we did here in Fremont. Um, we're working very hard to limit the ramp inefficiencies, but certainly fixed cost uh, absorption uh, and having all of the labor ready as we ramp will have an impact on Q4. Um, is it, uh, 
On the margin improvement, you know, a, a couple of things there for auto gross margin. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, S and X average selling prices uh, increased from Q2 to Q3. I mean, that's important as, as I mentioned in the last earnings call, the prior powertrain versions of S and X provided significant headwinds on average selling price for that product in the quarter. Um, we, we've also done a bunch of work as a company uh, to become uh, more targeted in how we adjust pricing on our products and how we optimize that based on local supply and demand. And so I, I think there's a bunch of good work from the team uh, on that in Q3, which flowed through on our financials. Uh, and cost reduction has just remained a huge focus for us. It's hard to underestimate how much of that has been ingrained in the culture of the company. And Jerome and his team have done absolutely tremendous work there. So on every line item of our costs, whether it be manufacturing, labor, warehousing, logistics, um, there's just a tremendous amount of good, good work that happened there. Um, specifically on non-recurring items, uh, uh, two that I'll note, one being the smart sum in revenue recognition, uh, debatable whether that's considered uh, a recurring or not, given that we continue to expect to release more features and release revenue associated with that in the future. But we did want to call that out specifically and the dollar value around that, as we know there's been speculation around the impact for the quarter. Uh, and uh, foreign exchange is just something that, since we don't hedge, it has an impact and it comes and goes every quarter. So we'll have to see as the quarter plays out uh, the, the effect that that has. Thank you. Our next question comes from Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Hi, everyone. This is uh, George Daly on for Adam. Um, so first question, is it, is it a fair assumption to say that once the Shanghai Gigafactory is ramped, Model, the Model 3 sold in China for China could be the, the most profitable car you sell, even more profitable than the average car made at Fremont right now? Um, but, uh, th that one's also difficult to forecast. It's a good question. Um, it, at least based on the plans that we have now, uh, we're expecting it to be roughly in line with um, where Model 3 is coming out of our Fremont factory. There's, a, there's still a bunch of work around cost optimization in the factory after we launch with ramp inefficiencies, and we need to work those costs down. Uh, and then there will be work to, uh, to land on what the right mix is within the country um, and where we ultimately land on the product uh, offering. So I, I think just for now, it's safe to assume that it's roughly in line with the margins that you see coming out of the Fremont facility. Great. And then if I could just sneak in one more. So it's been over seven years since you launched the Model S, and many OEMs seem that they don't have the same commitment to battery electric vehicles that, that you do, and many don't even offer one right now. Um, as your as your business model proves to be more sustainable, can we potentially see Tesla maybe supplying other OEMs with batteries or software, or complete uh, electric vehicle architectures, maybe in an effort to accelerate mass adoption of sustainable transport? Yeah, I think this. Um It would be consistent with the mission of Tesla to help uh, other car companies uh, with electric vehicles uh, on the battery and powertrain fronts, possibly on other fronts. Um, so it's something we're open to. Uh, as I think a lot of people know, we open sourced our patents um, uh, so that uh, those would not serve as an obstacle to the adoption of electric vehicles or uh, solar power or um, stationary storage. Um, and um, we're, we're definitely open to um, supplying batteries and powertrains and tough sort of things to other car companies. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Maynard M. with Macquarie. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is software version 10 added a lot of functionality that's never really been available in a car before through an over-the-air update. Um, in, in your shareholder letter, you say that this lays an important foundation for things to come. Can you just talk about the longer-term plan or your vision for the direction of the software platform and if you have plans to uh, monetize that opportunity? Well, 
the, the goal for the infotainment, infotainment system is to say, well, what's the most amount of fun you can have in a car? Which I think is a, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think other car companies really think about it that way, but surely what is the most fun, how can we maximize the enjoyment of a car such that it's not some, you know, just some, some sort of transport utility device with no soul and no character? Um, we want it to be fun and entertaining, irreverent, uh, you know, something that you love. And so that's, that's just, I think there's a lot one can do because, you know, people are generally spending, you know, a couple of hours a day on average in the car. And so that, that's a pretty high percentage of their waking time, um, you know, outside of like, you know, showering and going to the bathroom and that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of time. Um, and I, I guess maybe there's some way to monetize it, but we haven't really thought about it that way. But our goal is just to make, try to say what is the most fun you could possibly have while you're in your car. Um, and obviously as autonomy gets better and better, that is going to become much more of an entertainment opportunity. Um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see where that leads, but that's the, that's what we're after. It's our goal. Great. And, and then can you help us um, help for us the opportunity for emission credits as the standards in the EU start to tighten next year? And I'm not looking for an exact number, but maybe more to understand whether this is an opportunity in, in the you know tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, anything to help us frame the opportunity and, and also whether you have any uh, ongoing dialogues with OEM. Thanks. We certainly have ongoing dialogues with OEMs, but um, as you see from a from financial study, the tax credits or emissions credits are are not forming a, a, a very big percentage of our revenue. Uh, they're, I mean, like what what was it, the last, last quarter was pretty quite. It was, it was over a hundred billion dollars. Oh, but out, out of like several billion, so it's, yeah. it's like one and a half percent. You know, it's not uh, it's, it's not exactly a, a, a giant percentage. Um, and and obviously the there's. Credit credits in the U.S. are really not, you know, the credit situation not not, not particularly strong for obvious reasons, which we think is not great for the future. But anyway, that's the way it is. Um, in in Europe, there's uh, much more of a sensitivity to the environment, um, but we're we're not counting on some big windfall. Um, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be. Good. Maybe not. We don't know. But we're we're not counting on it. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to characterize it. I mean, our expectations are that credit revenues will generally increase with time, not necessarily increasing every quarter. We did increase from Q2 to Q3, but um, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of them that are baseline based on the number of cars that we build and deliver, and there's others that are deal specific, and those deals can happen at any point. So we're constantly in conversations with automakers about this, but within the company, uh, we manage the business uh, without um, counting on any profit or cash flows from regulatory credits, and we view it as, as purely incremental, uh, and my, my recommendation is that everyone should view it that way. It's just an extra as it comes through. It's, it's obviously a good thing to do that would help accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, uh, for sure, um, but, it, but it's... Uh, and, and like I said, I think outside the U.S., there seems to be a strong push in that direction, which is great. Um, and and probably the, within the U.S., that you know over time will become a strong push. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Emmanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Hi, it's Edison uh, for Emmanuel. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, first. Um, there's been a lot of activity in the industry about electric pickups lately. I'm just curious if um, you have any updates, um, any more insights you can share on the one that you're about to put out later. And then secondly, um, there was a comment, I think, earlier about the order book quarter to date. Um, can you just clarify what was the baseline and any insights about the, the geographic mix of that? Thanks. Um, yeah, we, 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 we don't, I think we've said enough about the, the Tesla Cybertruck. We're not going to, this is not the right forum for us to do product launches. Um, but I think it'll be, we'll, we'll be, 
uh, I mean, my, my, my opinion, and this could be totally wrong, it could be totally out to lunch here, but uh, I think the Tesla Cybertruck is our best product ever. That's my opinion. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the demand is not, is, is not, not it seems to be strong. It's, it's, it will, should be production constrained this, this quarter. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the baseline from the comment earlier that I made was uh, looking at this point uh, in the quarter in Q2. Um, and uh, order rates are strong, I would say, on all markets. Um, I think we're very encouraged as a team at the reception of our products. As uh, more and more people become aware of electric vehicles, I, I think uh, competitive products help raise that awareness, and overall interest is just increasing. So our focus internally uh, is to increase production as fast as we can, both with existing equipment and accelerating our timelines on new capacity. Uh, we believe that everybody should be driving an electric car, so we need to move as quickly as we can. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we're, we're, we want to get the Tesla volume to where it is, you know, perhaps, perhaps somewhere on the order of 1%, replacing 1% of the global fleet over time. Um, that's, I think, global fleet's pretty big. Uh, but that, that's, you know, we think that's a, that's a good one to aim for. Um, you know, which is about 20 million vehicles a year, just by the way. But I, I do think that the demand for new cars will rise um, as the, the world transitions away from uh, combustion engine vehicles. Um, just just as when, when you know, uh, when, when people had CRT TVs, there's normal um, cathode ray tube TVs, the, the sales rate was just basically a replacement rate. You wouldn't, buy, you wouldn't really buy a new, a new CRT TV uh, Unless you was broke, but when when flat screens came out, there was a, a big step change in demand because now getting a big flat screen TV was much much better than having um, a, a small CRT TV. And I think we'll see the same thing with electric vehicles, which is that the instead of just people just buying a car just because the, the, the their last car wore out, they'll they'll buy an electric car because it's a fundamentally better car, and especially if it's got uh, self driving. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Pierre Farragut with New Street Research. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'd love to hear how you... How you hear, how you sir. We can't hear you. You're, it's very quiet. So we can't hear you. Oh. Can you hear me well? It's muffled, but we'll try. Uh, okay. Sorry for that. Um, so I was wondering how your thinking has evolved on Model S and Model X. It looks like the, 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 the deliveries have stayed to the levels of, uh, of the previous quarter, and that Model 3 has indeed cannibalized this uh, demand for these cars uh, quite a good deal. So how are you thinking about these two models going forward? What's, uh, what's the, strategy, the strategy you have in mind? And I'll have a quick follow-up on the Model Y. The, the Model S and X are... are are really niche, they're really niche products. I mean, they're they're very expensive, made in low volume. Um, to be totally frank, we're keep we're, we're we're continuing to make them more for sentimental reasons than anything else. The, they're 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 really of of minor importance to the future. Okay, that makes sense. And then my question: they're, they're great cars. Sorry, the Model S, I think, is by is if if you want to. I mean, it, the Model S literally won Motor Trend's best car ever in history. By the way, I, I think it, if some if, if you're out there and, and you're buying and and, you, and you're standby and you, and you don't buy a Model S, you I think you've just made a mistake. Uh, to be totally frank, um, it's incredible, especially the new one with the uh, uh, you, you know variable damping suspension, uh, hospital operating room, HEPA filter for air purification. Uh, the, the Raven powertrain, uh, which it, it's, it's the fastest car in the world, um, and, and it's just it's so easy to drive. It makes you feel like Superman driving that car. It's incredibly safe. Um, you know, it's just uh, an amazing vehicle. And then Model S, I think, is like the Fabergé egg of cars. Uh, I mean, the Model X. Model X is like the Fabergé egg of cars. 
Um, you know, it's, um, I mean, that's why so many art, uh, artists and musicians uh, buy the cards. This is a, this is an art piece, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just that I agree. They're f- absolutely phenomenal cards, um, and we are increasing production on um, on our F and X lines for this quarter in response to increasing demand. And so, I, I think part of the story here is, you know, as we've launched Rant and Stabilized Model 3, that's kind of consumed a lot of the attention around the company. But now that as that has stabilized, we're able to focus our attention and balance that between S and X and Model 3. And so the, the delivery numbers in Q3 uh, understated the interest in the product for that quarter, uh, and we continue to see strength in the order rate, which uh, we anticipate will be reflected in S and X deliveries in Q4. Yeah, I mean, the model, model S, um, the basic model S at this point has a range of 370 miles. Actually, technically it's 373, but we actually uh, certified it incorrectly <laughs> as 370, but it's 373. Um, and there are some software improvements that we think will make that even better. Um, oh, uh, I forgot to mention, we're also expecting that the, the, there's, there's going to be an over there uh, improved. Uh, that, that will improve the uh, power of the Model S, X, and 3. That's, uh, by, by the way, it's, just, it's coming in, in a few weeks. Um, it should be on the order of um, 5% uh, power improvement uh, due to um, improved firmware. Crew, do you want to say anything on that? Uh, yeah, we just continue to learn how to optimize the motor control in, in our products. And, yeah, yeah, so 5% improvement for all Model 3 uh, customers and uh, 3% for S and X. Yeah, and there's also the, the single-pedal driving Yep, uh, that's that will improve the range as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Very excited about that. It's gonna it's an improvement in comfort and feel. Uh, yeah, it's just basically it's easier to drive and it improves the range. Yes. Um, and faster supercharging. Oh, and faster supercharging for uh, yeah. standard range and standard range plus customers, which is a, a big deal. Yeah, yeah it's uh, this. I don't think it's ever been a situation in history where you buy a car and it gets way better over time just due to software. Like not a little bit better, but a lot. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it's very exciting. I, yeah. I think, yeah, as a customer myself, I, I I enjoy these updates. Always look forward to them. <laughs> yeah, it might, might might move the Model S range to almost through 380 or through high 370s um, mm-hmm. with with the update. And we're not stopping to work there. We will continue working on the yeah. air development. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Pierre, did, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, yeah, just a quick one on uh, on the Model Y. So, uh, I was wondering if you what you've learned with uh, SNX makes you think maybe when you launch uh, Model Y, you'll have some cannibalization of demand on the Model Three. And have you started to think about that and uh, and uh, how to approach it? No, I don't think we're not expecting to see a uh, cannibalization of Model Three. One's a sedan, one's a SUV. Yeah, the best comparison we have for that is when we launched Model X, when we had Model S at the time. Yeah, and Model S sales increased. Yeah, and it, it was, it, we didn't see any cannibalization there. The, the, the opposite. Yeah. Uh, like yes. When we launched Model X, Model S sales increased. Yep, yeah, so that's the best comparison that we have. Great. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next question. Thank you. Our next question comes from Dan Levy with Credit Suisse. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you for taking the questions. Uh, first, just wanted to ask a question on, on a Giga 3. You're targeting 3,000 units a week, but we saw with Fremont that uh, the ramp on Model 3 uh, was lumpy, uh, and you sort of ramp and then sort of cut production to fix the bottlenecks. Um, given this is a brand new capacity, uh, how smooth should we expect production to be on a week-to-week basis, meaning once you hit the 3,000, is that 3,000 you could go every single week and a quarter, or is it still going to be lumpy within a quarter. I mean, I mean, if you've got a crystal ball, we'd love to use it. Um, I'm looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it should be smoother than Model 3 because there's a, a lot of commonality for parts. Um, but um, and, and I think if you look over a reasonable enough time frame, 
the, the production will actually be fairly smooth. Um, but from a week-to-week -week standpoint, it, it obviously will not be. Um, it'll be about as smooth as, say, the stock market, or how smooth is the stock market from one week to the next. Um, it, it, it's, but if you just extend the time period to, say, you know, two or three quarters, it will be a very, you know, very rapid steady round. Um, and obviously it'll go way, way past 3,000 a week. Okay. Great, thank you. And then just to follow up, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, Ilan, you mentioned earlier in your comments that one of the things you're optimistic on in the future is Tesla energy. And I think we understand the part that, you know, the, one of the challenges in the past was sort of a reallocation of resources away from energy to the auto side. Um, could you just talk to where you see the greatest pockets of growth in energy? Is it solar or storage? And now that you have to, now that you can reallocate resources, what would that entail in terms of capacity growth or what, what does reallocation of resources look like? Well, I think on a percentage basis, solar will grow the fastest, um, but uh, storage will also grow high on a percentage basis. I think both over time will grow faster than automotive, um, but starting from smaller bays. Um, uh, you know, I think if, especially if you, if you look at sort of, if you look at like year over year growth, it'll be an, it, absolutely incredible, I think. From one quarter to the next, there, there might be some fluctuations due to seasonality, or you know, some short-term part shortage, or you, you, you know, you name it. It could be, but over the course of say a year, gigantic increase. Um, it's also with, with solar, it's hard to install a lot of solar in you know in the winter, especially on the east coast, the roofs full of snow and ice. Mm -hmm. um, so you will expect to see some seasonality there, but but then it, it ramps up quite a bit when as the weather improves. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately all the time we have today. Uh, appreciate all your questions, and we're looking forward to talking to you next quarter. Thank you very much, and goodbye. All right. Thanks.